I'm Aaron Meyer, today's producer, and you're listening to the 199 Podcast. On today's episode, we talk about the Bulldogs' memorable March Madness run with Whit Hughes and Bart Heitch. They were both members of the first and still only Final Four birth in school history. For somebody like me, you know, Mississippian, born and bred, they're, they're, they're really deep ties. My great-grandfather was the first head of the MSU Foundation. My grandfather played football, basketball, and baseball there back in the 40s. My grandmother, I would argue you'd have a hard time finding somebody with deeper ties to Mississippi State. We're also going to talk with Whit and Bart about about their respective journeys to Starkville, playing basketball at a school where football reigns supreme, and taking down Big Blue Nation in the SEC tournament. When Coach Williams came to my house and he had never seen me play basketball, he sat on my couch with his legs crossed, and my dad said, so you're gonna offer him here today and you've never seen him play. And Coach Williams said, absolutely. Now, on to the show. Uh, hey, we're a long way from 1996, Whit and Bart, but thanks for joining us here on the 199 Podcast. Thank you, Danny. Appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for having us, man. All right. Well, let's let's dig in. So, you know, we're all about celebrating basketball history here on the 199 Podcast, and we're going to talk quite a bit about the Mississippi State's 1996 Final Four team, but I want each of you to take us back a little further. How did you first get involved with basketball? Um, man, how much? Uh, how long do you have? Uh, but first off, uh, I've... My late father, um, from the earliest memories I had growing up in Northwest Alabama, um, I was in a gym. Uh, Daddy loved basketball. Um, he played uh, briefly at a, at a small level, um, but it was just always basketball. He would wake me up every morning and ask me what sport I wanted to play from the time I was four or five years old, and we would go at it all day. And it was usually basketball, or if it was another sport, it always ended up at basketball at the end. So it's been a part of my life. Um, it's been my love, and uh, just very fortunate uh, to be a to be a part of the game uh, in, in ways that you know, you know, sometimes went nationally, uh, sometimes went locally. But it's it, basketball has always been a huge part of my life, and I have to I have to thank my dad for that. Cool. What about you, Whit? Yeah, I would reference my dad as well. I would. I was one of the key, these kids that had a ball in his hand everywhere he went growing up. Uh, basketball was always my first love. I think some of that may have had to do with having an older brother that was a recognized uh, football player. So I probably wanted a little bit of my own identity. But uh, I played a little bit of everything growing up. But uh, you know, if I had any free time on my hands, I was looking. I was trying to get into a gym and and play some basketball. Now, both of you guys are Mississippi guys, born and raised, right? I'm not. Um, I'm from Northwest Alabama, which is about 35, 40 minutes uh, across the state line, probably about an hour and 10 minutes from Starkville. Wait, Bart, you don't, you don't think, you don't think Danny up in Chicago knows where Winfield, Alabama is? (laughs) I'll tell you this. I I would be surprised because everybody typically knows one person from Winfield. Um, But but one of the reasons that Daryl Wilson and I grew up uh, playing in our tribal high schools together across the state in Alabama. But it was actually closer to Starkville than Jackson or like where Whit was from. So it was all kind of in the vicinity just across the state line. Gotcha, gotcha. And, and so for for either of you, but you guys both grew up in, in, in football communities, like football yeah, reigned supreme yeah. in the South. So for you guys, was was getting involved with basketball, were you kind of outliers or – are, is, is this a northerner maybe over underestimating how big basketball is in the south you know i think you're probably overlooking how big baseball is here um especially if you go back to that time frame and specifically the 80s uh in mississippi mm. state uh i mean that's I, w- I would argue it's as much as of a baseball school as it is a football school um Will Clark, Palmero, Jeff Brantley, Bobby Thigpen, that whole crew, you know, yeah, Will 1985, Clark, uh, you know, arguably the best team in college baseball. They, they didn't win the World Series, but, uh, you know, that's probably another topic for another pod- podcast. For me, it was it was different. I grew up football. Um, Chucker, I didn't miss a football game home or away. Auburn University until I was in the eighth grade and started playing varsity football. 
um, it was all football. And I played football. That was my number one love. But, you know, basketball just took that over. Um, as far as the household, it was always – it's always – football dictated everything. But basketball was the love. I should say it like that. Um, so, yeah, but I grew up in a small town, man, of 4,000 people. So you, you pretty much have to play everything um, where I grew up. So um, it was a lot of – it was a lot of all of it. Look, there's no question that we're in a part of the world, though, where football is kind of woven into the fabric of the culture. I mean, it's when it's football season, that's all anybody thinks about and talks about. And when it's not football season, that's still all anybody thinks about and talks about. And I know we're going we're gonna to come back to that here in terms of Mississippi State and kind of your 1995-1996 season. So let's kind of th- they'll stick to how did each of you guys end up at Mississippi State? Kind of what leads you to start, Bill? Well, I, I, you know, I wasn't a highly uh, recruited uh, prospect coming out of high school. Uh, you know, when the process boiled down for me, I was really focused on some opportunities uh, at Davidson and SMU. Uh, Davidson was interesting because I really wanted to play for Coach McKillop, who recently, uh, who recently actually retired at Davidson. And uh, he you know, coached S- some guy named Steph. Yeah, I've heard of that guy. <laughs> Um, he's, he's made a few, he's made a few shots over the years. Um, and I actually lived in Charlotte for a period of time. So I came to appreciate more about Davidson and that school and that community. But, um, SMU was just a cool spot. Um, you know, I liked the thought of going to school there, being in Dallas. And at the time, my girlfriend, who's now my wife was actually thinking about going to SMU as well. So that probably, that probably had a little bit to do with it, but I, I ultimately, uh, went to Mississippi State because Ron Polt, the baseball coach at the time, reached out to me and proposed a scenario where I could come to come to school there and actually play both baseball and basketball. And so for somebody like me, you know, Mississippian, born and bred, uh, I won't go into all the detail about my family connections to MSU, but but they're 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 really deep ties. My great grandfather was the first head of the MSU Foundation. My grandfather played football, basketball, and baseball there back in the 40s. My grandmother uh, was, the, was the homecoming queen back in the early 40s. So uh, I would argue you'd have a hard time finding somebody with deeper ties to Mississippi State than, than I have. And what about you, Bart? Uh, for me, it was a totally different road. Um, I was trying to decide what to play. Um, and I think most would tell you baseball. Baseball was, my, was probably my best sport and my highest upside. Um, it was just too slow. And so I was getting recruited in football, um, in, ba- you know, in basketball, of course, in baseball a little bit off and on. But the coin on me was that I was playing basketball. And my whole goal that my, from my whole life, um, from about the time I was 10 years old at Auburn basketball camp, I heard somebody say that he may be good, but he'll never play in the SEC. Um, and that was my goal. Um, when I got – for me, pretty much it was going to be Auburn. And then uh, Cliff Ellis came in and Auburn uh, was waiting on Doc Robinson and really didn't want to uh, put the program in the hands of someone, I think, at my size, to be honest. And it made sense. Um, and so Alabama had offered me early um, and then rescinded the offer, um, which made me dislike them even more than I did growing up. Uh, and then I had a UT Chattanooga offer, soft offers from Notre Dame and Texas Tech. That, but it just when, when, uh, when, when, Coach Williams came to my house, and he had never seen me play basketball, um, not one time. He, he trusted Rick Stansberry as opera talent that much. He sat on my couch with his legs crossed, and my dad said, so you're going to offer him here today, and you've never seen him play. And Coach Williams said, absolutely. We want him to come to Mississippi State. So I kind of had the same deal Whit did. I was going to kind of try to play both, but as Whit will tell you, that very first day of basketball when I was trying to leave and go to baseball practice uh, – Coach Williams came down and said, your baseball career is over. Uh, you'll be in the weight room. So that was kind of how my baseball career ended, and it was just basketball, and, uh, and, and and I wouldn't change anything about it. What about you, Whit? Did you end up playing baseball for the Bulldogs? I did. I, I, was, I was on the team for my first two years. Uh, it, was, it was a lot to balance when you go from, from, you know, you're doing fall baseball while the basketball team's doing their all-season conditioning program, and then that ends, and you go to the first day of basketball, and you're out of shape, and you know, by the time, you know, spring baseball comes around, they're already, uh, you know, you finish basketball and you're five or six weeks into the baseball season. So uh, I, the best way to the best way to describe it is I was on the team and on the roster. Uh, you know, a lot of people assume that I would uh, there was a likelihood that I would quit basketball and focus on baseball. 
But to me, SEC baseball was a much bigger adjustment than basketball, actually. I mean, Bart Bart understands where I'm coming from on that because I've been to all the summer camps. I mean, I competed against some of the best basketball players, certainly in the Southeast, uh, over the years growing up. But, you know, you know, I had never seen 85 and 86 mile per hour breaking balls. Uh, so when you get to that level and, and you're dealing with SEC pitching and you're not focused on it full time, uh, it, it becomes a, it becomes an uphill climb from a competitive standpoint. And, you know, you're talking about world-class base, baseball players coming, coming to Starville to play for Mississippi state every year. So some of my best memories are from baseball. I mean, there's nothing better than experiencing running out onto duty of a field, uh, some of my best friendships that have turned into lifetime friendships come come out of the, the experiences I had on the baseball team. But, but yeah, my first year, I actually redshirted in both. Um, so the 96 Final Four year was actually my redshirt sophomore so year. So your first year then, so Witt, you're a year older than Bart. Or you're two years older than Bart, correct? It's it's kind of a complicated question because because they all accuse me of failing high school, fa- failing kindergarten because I got held back because my dad knew I was going to need to grow. So our ages are uh, our ages are two three years apart, but we're only I think one year apart when it comes to eligibility. Yes, gotcha. So Whit, your first year on the team at, Mich- at Mississippi State, um, the Bulldogs get their first uh, their only their second NCAA tournament bid since the nineteen sixty three season. That's the the famed game of change against Loyola University. Uh, the 1995 campaign, Mississippi State gets a 22-8 22, 22 record, Sweet 16 appearance. So the arrow's pointing up uh, for Mississippi State basketball. So let's we're going to dive into the 1995-96 season here because that's, that's the one that ends in the Final Four. So you guys enter that season, a preseason top 10 team. That's not really where we're accustomed to seeing at Mississippi State basketball. So I want to each of you guys, if you could just characterize the vibe of that team as that 1995-1996 season opens up. Yeah, Chucker, let me let me actually take you back a little bit further because I think the arrow started pointing up back in the 90-91 season. Uh, MSU actually won an SEC championship that year, uh, which is you know MSU basketball was was not known for consistent success. So uh, that was a big deal, and I think that was kind of you know, kickstarted a, a, a little bit of a culture shift uh, for the program. And then if you go to my 93-94 uh, would have been my red shirt, my red shirt year, we actually made the, uh, the NIT that year. You know, a little side note is that we were, I think this is right, I believe we were, you know, back then it was all about getting to 18 wins. You had to get 18 wins to get into the tourney. Well, we were the first 18-win SEC team to not make the tournament. So you talk about a chip on the shoulder, you know, we're sitting there, you know, you remember CBS used to have camera crews filming teams, watching the selection show. And well, well, we were that team that everybody got to see, you know, deflated when they announced all the pairings and realized that we had not made the tournament. So we went, we went as a very, what I would say, uninterested, uninterested group and played uh, at Kansas state in the NIT and uh, the ski of Jones and, and that whole crew ended up uh ended up beating us but you know that was i think that was a real pivotal point because you had people like david domain and marcus grant on that team that from a leadership standpoint really raised the bar uh when it comes to expectations uh in the program and that certainly developed a lot of momentum because the summer the summer after that season uh mississippi state basketball went on a trip of finland we did a tour of finland and played several teams and several communities and obviously had time to, you know, fellowship time throughout that trip that allowed us to come, come closer together as, as teammates. And I think that was a springboard into the 94, 95 year, uh, which, you know, I would argue that that team was a final four capable group uh, as well. I mean, we won at Rupp arena that year, you know, made it into the tournament, uh, actually played Santa Clara and Steve Nash in the first round out, out in Boise, Idaho, uh, beat Utah, Keith Van Horn, and, you know, Coach Majerus and that whole crew. And then if you'll remember, uh, Danny, that was when uh, UCLA was was on the ropes against Missouri. And you remember Tyus Edney had to take it the length of the court in like the last three and a half seconds and kind of threw up a off-balance hook shot that, that went in and allowed UCLA to advance. And then they beat us in the Sweet 16 and went on to win the championship. So I think, I think all that, you know, in short – 
kind of helps you understand where we were coming into that final four season. We, we had confidence. We had every reason to have expectations and believe in ourselves, but we also had plenty of material that gave us a, a big time chip on our shoulder. And then, you know, Bart, you're coming in as a freshman. I mean, did, how did you kind of fit into this, this culture and, and, and kind of this energy that was building then as, as Witt explains a couple years going on? Well, first off, <clears throat> I mean, it, it was a little bit more difficult walking in when you got guys over there like Witt that won't even look at you or talk to you. You know, that was kind of the rule with freshmen coming in. I mean, it was two months before anybody really – like like literally in the weight room and stuff, it's just kind of an initiation thing. You know, th- there wasn't a lot of communication early. I got there in the summer, so I came early. Um, and I always went to summer school, and I would recommend that for any kid, especially coming out of high school, just for the adjustment level of whether it be school, whether it be the workouts, what have you. So it was kind of a quiet summer, but Daryl Wilson 100% took me under his wing. Um, we were from the same place. He was one of my idols growing up. And so I was with him all the time, playing video games with he and Eric Moulds and um, just getting to know Startville. <clears throat> and then I remember meeting Marcus Bullard uh, in second semester. Everybody started coming in. Um, like coming back for second semester and we started playing a lot of pickup and that's when I realized it was different and, and, and I was still I, I was very difficult it was very difficult for people to stay in front of me and so in those pickup games man this is just this is awesome you know I'm just playing like I always am you know what have you um, but then when we got to weights and conditioning um, and we got to coach Akins uh, our strength coach and the off season started it was just a completely different level and deal. Um, but there was always one word, whether it was Coach Aikens, because we didn't see Coach Williams a lot before that season. Um, if it was Coach Aikens or if it was Daryl or Russ or, you know, Witt was vocal, but it was mainly the seniors. And you'd hear Damp say something every once in a while. There was an accountability with everything we did, Chucker. Every single thing, I mean, whether it was pickup, I'd make a bad pass or something, Daryl would correct me. Daryl was, and it was like, it was almost like I was being coached into this, you know, minimal, if you will, role coming up on this Final Four team because we only played seven or eight people, right? And it was, only, and that's how it was going to be, and that's Coach Williams' system. And so I just felt like from day one, whether it be eliminating the baseball or how I was playing or how I was working out, um, I just felt like it all started with accountability of having to get your work done, you know, and make sure in every single, not just workout – every single rep that you were being a bulldog. Um, and that that's just something that we all know what that means. You know, Bart, you know, Bart, I know you've had people your whole life tell you how special you are, but that's, that's why nobody would talk to you that first month or two is because even a bunch of guys from Mississippi and Alabama had never met anybody quite like you. If I walk out here on this court right now, I still think I'm going to drop 50. <laughs> so, so y'all just you know, y'all we were intimidated by the Nike socks and sandals. You kind of mentioned football, kind of rain, you know, football rules down there in the South. And you know, we could talk about Mississippi State being uh, a baseball school, which it certainly is, but uh, it, it certainly has a very strong football ethos. And so, I want to talk about the dynamic of a basketball program at a football school in a football state. So. How would you guys describe the state of Mississippi State basketball, particularly in relation to the football team? Kind of what's what's the pecking order, so to speak? And it, it's interesting to note that during that 19, as you guys, as the football season is kind of uh, going on in the fall, you guys are working out, and that football season's not very good under Jackie Sherrill. They're three and eight. So, but yet basketball is going into the season a top 10 team. Is it still football dominated? Just what's that dynamic like? Well, <clears throat> for me, you know, like now I'll, I'll speak as a, like, and, I, and I'll go backwards, like as a fan, you know, I've been a season ticket football holder to Mississippi State for, you know, probably 12 years, you know, 14 years. Um, and I go to every home game and I tailgate and I and I think football just comes with so much more. You know, like if you're going to a football game, it's an all day event and you're going to see friends, and you're eating, you're hanging out, you're watching other games. And, it's, and typically with a basketball game, it's you go to the basketball game and you come back and same way with baseball. You know, baseball is an all-day affair at Mississippi State. Basketball is not. But um, for me, I, I didn't grow up in the Mississippi State culture. Um, I, I grew up in the Auburn culture, which was more football. I remember going on my visit with um, Jay Walton and Russell Walters took me on my visit, and Mississippi State played Auburn. And I was secretly pulling for Frank Sanders and Auburn. You know, like I didn't cheer or anything. But at the same time, Mississippi State, from a football standpoint, 
was always typically in my household uh, on the schedule. That was a game that you were going to win. You know, Auburn was going to win if you, if you will. But that changed almost like, you know, when I got to school there, if you, if you go back and look at Mississippi State football from then until now, I mean, state football has been relevant, you know, not every year, but, and not winning national championships, but just, you know, in the West, which is always the toughest, it's been relevant. But I, I, I just think basketball, um, when I got there, there was excitement. The program wasn't down. There was an SEC championship five years before that. It just been to the NIT, just coming off a Sweet 16 run that you could have gone further and expectation levels through the roof. And, you know, thanks to Dante Jones uh, uh, and Tyron Washington, I became part of one of the top recruiting classes in the country thanks to those two guys. So everybody was excited about me also. Um, but basketball was uh, – it was hype when I got there, so I, I never really knew anything different other than state basketball being exciting. Yeah. Fans. All right, man. So it's just interesting to note, like, I mean, you know, midnight half, midnight madness happens during the heart of the football season, but there's already energy for you guys uh, going on for the basketball program. Well, it was national. You know, I mean, ESPN2 was coming to – Number one, Midnight Madness, it was just when they really started televising them a lot, you know, and, and ESPN had really gone into basketball fully, and I think they saw the monster that it was becoming um, and the opportunity. But, yeah, when we walked out for that Midnight Madness, man, I, I mean, it was like, wow, this is – and I I played in front of 13,000 people in the state championship game, but this was just different. There was a different ele- there's a different electricity when it comes to basketball, man. You know, I've stood on sidelines at football stadiums and the roars and this, but the electricity, the, I call it the electric headache. There's been about four or five times in my career. Um, Final fours won, state championships won, that night's won. Um, that I just there was immediately like an instant pounding in your head because the excitement was so there. So what I I would totally agree that that Dan Bonner came that night. Um, and that was a that I knew then that I knew we were going to be relevant from what I was seeing, you know, what I was seeing every day in practice and what have you. But when I saw Dante Jones throw that ball up in the air from half court and, and leave right inside the free throw line and catch it with both hands and tomahawk it. Yeah. I, I was like, wow, I'm going to get to, I'm going to get to be a part of this. So yeah, it was special. Yeah. I mean, you guys do, you guys beat, uh, yeah, you, you do beat Oregon state. You do beat Nebraska. You do go on the road to Louisiana state. You do go on the road to Florida. You win those games. Cause you guys win 10 of your first 11. I think that that enthusiasm and that energy, I think the, you know, that snowball of momentum carried into the beginning of the year. I mean, we took care of some non-conference opponents, but I remember we, we, uh, you know, went on the road to Portland in the old Rose garden and beat Oregon state and Nebraska. And then, and then Bart, I think right after that, we, we maybe won in Baton Rouge and and at Florida. We did. Florida. I think we had. Um, um, you know, we started out rolling. I mean, but the thing, but the thing is, <clears throat> I mean, Danny, we we guarded people. You know, I mean, we we, we could really guard people, and, and and with Big Dan back there, you know, I mean, he's just a complete eraser. It was hard for teams to score. That was the thing I remember is how hard it was. <clears throat> excuse me for teams to score on us in the half court. Uh, we lost to Arkansas Little Rock on a, on a tip in to Coach Sanderson at home, um, and then that kind of got us refocused, and we went out to Portland. And that Nebraska team we beat had two pros on it. Teron Lou was on that team, and Evan Strickland that played for Celtics, and they were good. Um, I didn't I didn't even play I didn't play that game because Coach Williams didn't think I could handle the pressure. With you remember, you actually had to play the two because I, I he didn't think I was ready to handle that kind of physicality, you know, and, it, and the situation worked out right. Um, but then, yeah, we started out SEC, that Florida win was key. Um, but then we kind of had some stuff among the team here and there a little bit. I think that's when that started, you know, probably about three or four games in the SEC season. Cause we ended up going and losing four out of five until we got you to that, do. the pivotal South Carolina game that, and I'll let Wick can, I mean, if that's where we're going, you know, that the South Carolina game to me on the road that we lost was the most pivotal so you guys go point in the season. you go through this skid i'm curious about so you talk about the south carolina game what happens because i think all these teams have a turning point where it's you know you know you either got to move forward or you're going to disintegrate so like we've seen a lot that happen with a lot of teams over the years you know you you have high expectations you hit a rough patch and then everything unravels what kept you guys together what was that south carolina what was pivotal about that south carolina game how did you guys kind of march forward from this this rough patch in the middle of the season 
Yeah, it could have been could have been could have been five out of six because we we actually beat Tennessee at we home did. by one, and there was a controversial call at the end. Bart, you remember their coach Kevin O'Neill chased the referees down the tunnel after that game, you know, sharing his opinions on their officiating that we probably can't repeat here on the on the podcast. But it easily could have been losing four five out of six. Well, I, to me, it, it it was you know, and 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 Whit needs to be <clears throat> Whit needs to be given a lot of credit here. You know, I know I've told him I don't think a lot of fans know this, but like um, Dante was out for the Georgia game at home, um, and Whit stepped in, and I don't remember how many assists he had, I don't remember how many charges he took, I don't remember, but I just know he was solid and in that role, and it was like, you know, the team just kept going. You know, and and we, and we had and we just had this confidence. But when we got there, there was just, you know, and, and everybody's talked about it. You talked about it on the final four videos. You know, Dante had to figure out the structure probably more than any of the rest of us did. I couldn't understand motion for anything because I was used to just running the ball and getting it and shooting it. But when, but you know, shot selection, how hard you have to play on defense. That was kind of the game and moment that Coach Williams like laid the gauntlet down. He said, Tay. You're going to have to do this and this and this. And he sat in. Same thing with me. I remember we came in. I came in the game. This is my favorite, one of my favorite Coach Williams stories. So we come in the game, and they were good, man. I mean, they went 15-1 and one the next year in the SEC. Um, and won South Carolina and yep. won the SEC. And their three guards, Melvin Watson, B.J. Mackey, and Larry Davis, I would argue was, the, was as good as any three guards that we I faced my whole career on the team. And, so I come off the bench with the normal 12 timeout, um, or right before it, probably 14 minutes. And uh, and I had this little sneaky, like just a little sneaky pocket cross. And I and, and it was to kind of just get people off while I while I used it. And Melvin Watson actually got stumbled and kind of kind of tripped a little bit. Well, I was about 23, 24 feet, and I'm pulling. You know, I mean, I and I was right off the bench. So I pull and it's in and out, you know, and ball goes out of bounds. We get the ball. Well, Coach Williams calls a, tw- uh, a 20, uh, a 30, whatever it was back then. And he comes over and we're standing there and he said, everybody good? Everybody need some water? Um, y'all okay? He said, freshman, let me explain something to you. When you're in the game, you're the fifth blank option. <laughs> and everybody started dying laughing. Um, and then, But we went out, we ended up losing that game, but that, after in the locker room, Coach Williams told us we had to make a decision. And when he walked out, Daryl and Russ um, and Jay Walton all said, this is it. And if you go down and look at the stats from Dante Jones that next game, the next practice was bought in. We were all on the same page. We knew what our roles were. Um, and we just started rolling after that South Carolina game. You know, Chucker, you had a bunch of guys, you know, outside of Dante from Nashville, you had a bunch of guys from Mississippi and Alabama, you know, some from more uh, – urban areas you know mostly from rural areas not many highly recruited um so it was a very interesting mix uh of of people and players that that were coming together and and uh you know i think the coaching staff deserves a lot of credit coach williams and 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 the rest of the coaches uh just in terms of defining those roles and responsibilities but helping everybody understand that you know this is we've got all the potential in the world but we also can't be worried about who's going to get credit. Everybody needs to buy in, embrace their roles, and understand that we're going to go as far as the team dynamic will allow us to go. And I think I think once Bart, once certainly once Dante got more into a flow of the structure and the system, and the fact that you um, you were going to have to defend and rebound, uh, otherwise you're going to figure out that that bench can be a pretty good coach too. Um, you know, every, all the pieces were in place. I mean, there was nobody. Bart mentioned our strength and conditioning coach, Richard Akins. I mean, there was no there was no team in the country that was more prepared for that season than we were. I mean, if you make it through his off-season programs, you are convinced that there's nothing for the rest of your life that you're not going to be able to handle. And so we went in every game. The coaches always had, you know, extremely detailed scouting reports. I mean – I felt like most of the time we knew the plays as well as – we knew the other team's plays as well as they did. There were there were a couple of occasions where I felt like we knew their plays better than they did. So the coaches always had us prepared from a scouting report standpoint. Uh, we were prepared physically, mentally, and emotionally. And, and like I said earlier, 
um, we had we had a chip on our shoulder and, and and something to prove. So coming out of that skid, uh, I, I think that skid was good for us in a lot of ways. It kind of brought us back to reality. I remember we we ran out for a home game after losing all those games, Barton. I think we had maybe like twenty five hundred or three thousand people in the stands, and so it it, it got our attention. And uh, but but again, to Bart's point. We had some excellent leadership on that team. People like Jay Walton, Russell Walters, Daryl Wilson. Uh, they, 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 they just weren't going to allow us to not be successful. So a question I love asking these guys, you know, you guys who played on, on some of these memorable teams is who was the heart or engine of that team? Like who made the team go? So for the Mississippi State 1996 team, who was it? Marcus Bullard. <clears throat> and why so? From your perspective, Bart. Well, I was getting hit in the face by him every day, about <laughs> 10 times a day at practice. Um, but um, he was my <clears> – <throat> excuse me, he, he was the point guard, and I was his backup. And um, Bull controlled the game in a way that was unlike anything I had really ever, ever seen. Like, he could control a game offensively and defensively, uh, especially defensively. Mm -hmm. um that and 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 bull was tough man and when bull spoke as a leader you know we mentioned those other guys that's not really a setting after that game when it's all going this it's all going that that bull's going to step up after that south carolina and say something bull's going to step up in practice that next practice and elbow somebody right in the face or knock somebody out of bounds and let you know that hey this practice is for real and you know, I think our coaches really, and I think we'll agree, <clears throat> or whether it was Russell or whether it was Damp, or, uh, and Daryl was always a leader, but our guys, you know, our leaders led with physicality. That, or that's how it was for me. I mean, the worse we were playing, the worse I was playing, the harder it was. And But I just think, I think, I think Bull in practice, how he dictated things um, and how we ran everything through him, but especially defensively, um, how he dictated, you know, he was the head of the snake. And I think that was, to me, the, the, the engine that always really got us started. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Bull, Bull definitely set the tone in terms of toughness. Um, I would also add that Daryl Wilson was very clearly kind of the, the spirit and soul of the team. You know, I, I, I love Daryl, um, and uh, I love everything about him. Uh, but I tell you what, from a leadership standpoint, you never had to wonder whether Daryl was willing to do whatever it would take to help the team be successful. And, you know, he, he was vocal, but I'm telling you, his leadership by example showed the team, you know, how to go about competing at, at that level. And so, you know, it's just like anything else. The team tends to take on the personality uh, of its coaches and its leaders, and that's what happened with this Final Four team. All right. Well, hey, you know, I appreciate that because I think it, it's always some interesting insight because, you know, every team has kind of its stars. And in your case, you know, you had Eric Dampier go on to have a long NBA career, probably the most uh, recognizable name, I think, to outsiders from your team. But when you talk about the engine or heart of the team, a lot of times it's a guy who maybe he's a starter, maybe he's a bench player. Sometimes it's 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 the strength and conditioning coach. It's the chaplain. It could be someone, you know, well outside of the team, too, who, who's the one who makes it really go. So it's always interesting to get that perspective. Look, don't don't discount Eric Dampier as a big secret to our success. Bart alluded to this earlier, but but when you had him protecting the rim, I mean, we overplayed everything on defense. Yes. everything because we knew if anybody got past us they were going to have to deal with him at the rim so we 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 won with with don't get me wrong we could score points but we won with defense and rebounding and, and Bart mentioned earlier the difficulty of, of scoring against us it, it was because you better score on that first shot because it was going to be a contested shot and then you certainly weren't going to get a rebound and get a second attempt after that so mm -hmm. and and Bart I think back to the practices with the Rebound rings, you know, you got to get three stops to get out. I mean, yeah, nobody just, ever wanted just, to be in my group. <laughs> <laughs> it just, it was just ingrained, and it was just ingrained into us as, uh, and we didn't know any other way to play at that point. Tell me how the rebound ring worked. You ever seen one of the, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a little device you can put on a ring, which, I mean, you can score, but it has to be an absolutely perfect shot. So, everything that comes up goes up is going to come off as, as a rebound and it's very unpredictable in terms of the way it bounces. So you basically have 
four, it'd be a four on four drill and a shot would go up and the defending team would have to get three stops in a row in order to get out. And look, that could go on for, for oh. minutes at a time. I mean, you might have a group in there for 10 minutes or more if, if, if they couldn't figure it out. So um, you talk about intensity level, you know, ha- have somebody make a mistake or miss a block out during that drill. You're gonna have some leader. You're gonna have some leaders get vocal about it pretty quick. Chucker, I was I was extremely strategic about which line I got in and who was in front and behind me in line. You know, I I, I was extreme, but but that was here's the thing <clears throat> to break that down just to make you understand how difficult it was. You had to have a foot in the lane, all right, and you had these people outside the three point line. All right, think about the space. It's not that much space, but it's enough space to get a run and go. And you could back up. And so, I mean, these guys are just getting a run and go. There would be times to where Bull would get a run and go and everybody would be running around and he would hit me and they'd have to stop the drill because I'd be down on the floor and people are going to land on me, you know, right in the middle of the lane. Because, I mean, there's nothing you can do when a 225-pound locomotive come. I mean, you just, just brace for whatever. But like Witt said, every one of those reps was hard. And if it wasn't, Daryl Wilson and Russell Walters and the, the I mean they were going at you because the more this is what Coach Atkins instilled in in those leaders that get trickled down to me that trickled down to every rep every single rep matters and if you mess one rep up you better make sure you don't mess up the next one and so there was always that play the next play basketball so fast it's what I teach now. Basketball is so fast. You have to play the next play and forget. But at the same time, you, you're you either going to, in that situation, that rebound drill, you're either going to man up um, or not. I mean, that's just how it is. You just got to find a way. And I think that's one of the things that uh, those leaders helped me do and helped us do. That's great. You know, we're going to get to talking about the postseason uh, here in a moment, but I just want to stick with the regular season on, on two questions. One, You guys host Kentucky at Humphrey Coliseum on January 9th, and it's a 74-56 loss to Kentucky. Now, that UK squad, that may be the most stacked basketball team in college in maybe the last 30 years. You're talking nine NBA players on that roster. Antoine Walker, Ron Mercer, Tony Delk, probably the most notable. You got an 18-year NBA vet in Nazi Mohammed averaging six minutes a game. So, I mean, that's how stacked they were. What were your impressions of that UK team when you matched up with them that day? Well, to your, to your nine, I'm going to tread lightly here, but to your nine uh, NBA players. Guys who logged NBA minutes. Six, but, but six of those guys, if I'm not mistaken, seven, I always say seven, but I know six of those guys were first round picks. Man, think about like what we talk about in football. There's 11 people on each side. We're 22 really, but like six first round picks on one team. So, there was a joke that their next five could be ranked number two. Hundred percent. Um, and, and that game we just weren't ready at home. Um, you know, I mean, it was so much hype. Uh, you know, so much. But you know, we we all we played well. Um, I mean, that game was at close. That point, you're you're ten and one at that point when you go into that game, too. right? So you guys with, are rolling with momentum, and it was it that was kind of our temperature check, you know. And but they had their run. We 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 turned it over three or four. I think it was three times in a row. And then they they got two buckets, one a fast break, um, one a three, and then something else happened. All of a sudden, bam, bam, that leads 12. Um, and then we just couldn't uh, – we missed a couple of shots, and the air went out of the building. And like I said, we just – we weren't ready to um, beat. We were ready to compete with a team on that level, but we weren't ready to do all the little things that you got to do to beat a team like that. And so that – Losing that game, and especially losing that game at home, I think I think if we go up to Rupp and get beat, I, I don't think it has the same effect as it did as them coming to our place. Because every time we walked on the court, I mean, we felt like our place was the hardest place to play in the country. And the hump gets loud, man. The hump, the hump gets rocking. And, you know, that deflation, um, I think, made us realize that we kind of had to go back to the drawing board a little bit. Sticking with the regular season, too, um, you guys split with Ole Miss that year. Now, that – the Ole Miss Mississippi State is the oldest rivalry in the SEC. Um, take us into that rivalry as players, because you know that rivalry is never going to get the attention, say, of Duke Carolina or um, you know some of the other great rivalries we see in college basketball, St. John's Georgetown, maybe even. You know, like so for you guys, 
I know that there's layers to this rivalry, but for as players, what's that rivalry like for you guys, Ole Miss, Mississippi State? Well, I would say the awareness and visibility of the rivalry is more of a reflection of the media market that we're in. You know, I mean, Mississippi is a population of, of 3 million people, but, um, but I would also say, and I believe this wholeheartedly, the intensity level around the Ole Miss and Mississippi State rivalry is, is unmatched. Um, a lot of that has to do with just a, you know, a generational uh, dynamic of, uh, you know, family, you know, history and such. I mean, it's, uh, and, and it's, it very, it's very, you know, the, the outcomes of the games in any sport is very rarely about necessarily who's quote unquote the best team at the time. It really depends a lot on whether you're at home or away and, and uh, you know factors like that, but it's it's uh, you know it's a, it's the same old deal. I mean, uh, you know that 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 SEC slogan it just means more. Uh, I mean that's a real thing when it comes to Ole Miss and Mississippi State because you're talking about having to deal with it and people you uh, in your family in some instances your your next door neighbors, people you work with, people you go to church with. Uh, I mean the the performance and success or lack of success of your particular team uh you know becomes a part of your identity uh if you're an old miss and mississippi state fan so i mean to say the biggest understatement in the world is to say that 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 rivalry is intense and it's taken you know, seriously you know what you see it from being a mississippi state guy bart you're a alabama guy who comes to mississippi state so what was your kind of perception of the rivalry because you know Witt grew up with it from your perspective? Well, I, I grew up in, you know, what some would consider definitely in the South the most heated, which is Auburn, Alabama. Um, and, you know, I, I just – I remember I remember rivalries growing up at Legion Field. I went to every game, Auburn, Alabama game, at Legion Field football, you know, and that was my – that was kind of my um, rivalry that game, this, that. But, I, you know, when I think about it, you know, years later, at the time I didn't understand this. Um but, you know, just just the true facts of, of the matter, Ole Miss and Mississippi State's program, let's just let's let's I think it, I think it's all sports, but let's just take football, for example. Uh, State and Ole Miss have not had the success in their history as Auburn and Alabama has. Right. So, you know, I think there's more of a respect for each other when it comes to Auburn, Alabama, based on the success that each one has had, because there's been more of it, especially nationally. Um, and I've talked to players that that, that talk about, um, you know, players that are on SEC in football, players that are on SEC, uh, excuse me, on ESPN, SEC Network in football and basketball, they're friends of mine, that they talk about that the cleanest game they would always play in was the Auburn-Alabama game, you know, where, where the guys would help, you know, the guys just, you know, each other. It ain't like that in the state of Miss rivalry. There's not a respect. You don't help anybody up. You don't, um, and it's and it's anything goes. I mean, it's it, it. There's a hate, and I think a lot of that comes from in an intensity. It just comes from both programs struggling for relevance. You know, for so long, for so long, for so long, and then when we get there, all the, I mean, it, it's at the relevant point. You know, but this rivalry's been building for you know the oldest rivalry ever, and so I just think there's a dynamic to that. It was it was it was interesting to me. And I always told them, I was like, it's not, it's different than, it's just different than Auburn, Alabama. Um, to me, uh, from a player standpoint, uh, the players dislike each other in every sport in the state Ole Miss rivalry, much more so than the, I would think anywhere else in the country. You know, I got to appreciate your candor because, you know, one of the things that will annoy me, I got my start in sports journalism and I would hear, you know, this coach speak, every game's the same, you know, next team up. And I'm sorry, man, I was a college athlete too. There were some teams and some guys I wanted to beat more than the next. And I'm sorry, man, going to South Carolina or Florida, you know, it's a meaningful game on the SEC calendar and you guys want to win, right? But Ole Miss is something else. <laughs> and so I appreciate the candor and, and really that perspective. That's interesting to hear. Look, Chucker, one of the, the only technical of my college career came against Ole Miss. Who was it? Was it J Jason Smith? Bart? He had a breakaway. He had a breakaway <laughs> layup. I was the only one able and to get defense. I, there's a midair collision as he's yes. going in to finish. Uh, you know, thinking he's about to dunk, and I pretty much tackled him in the air. 
we roll into the baseline and the cheerleaders and, you know, cameras and reporters and everybody else. And, you know, a fight broke out and, and, you know, I'm not going to comment on what was said or done in, in the few minutes after that, but, but yeah, I got rung up with a technical and, uh, by Curtis Shaw, you remember him, Bart? I had that, uh, by the way, I, I've had that com- a few conversations with him one a couple of years ago yeah. on King Street in Charleston. So, so interestingly <laughs> enough, Chucker, one, I mean, there was a fight about to break out, and one, and one oh, of the yeah. guys on the floor was actually Keith Carter, who's now old Mrs. Athletic Director. But let me promise you, in that three- or four-minute span after that altercation, it was not about anything going on in a basketball game. It was about Ole Miss and State, and we were about to go at it. <laughs> Interesting. Well, again, I appreciate the candor because I don't think all games are created equal. All right, so you guys finished the regular season 19-7. and seven. You're a solid NCAA tournament team, you know, but certainly collecting a few wins uh, in, in the SEC tournament won't hurt. So um, in the SEC tournament, you guys take down Auburn. You take down Georgia. You're um, staring at Kentucky in the SEC title game. This Kentucky team we just talked about earlier, pretty stacked squad. Um, what happens in the Louisiana Superdome on March 10th, 1996? Hey, those were good. The, all, Mark, those Auburn and Georgia teams it, it were good. It was hard now. to get there, man. That Auburn team, we beat Auburn three times that year. Um, and Auburn was really, really good. I mean, Doc Robinson, uh, Damian Fishback, Mamadou Njai. Um, you know, they had guys that were you know, going to go – Wes Flanagan, just an assistant at Auburn now. Um, they had guys that were going to continue playing. Um, but Georgia was a sweet 16 team. Um, and so, I just remember – I remember the focus being – we saw Kentucky. And we – and you just – you the thing about the SEC tournament is you can see the blue coming, you can see the blue coming, you can see the blue coming. Um, but we had to keep our focus those first couple of games. And, and to be honest – those three games were the best games that we played all season, collectively as a team. And the first one we played well, the second one we played really well, and the third one we played flawless. Um, but you know, I like I've got so many stories about that 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 Kentucky game. So we I talk about those, I guess talk about those first two before we get to Kentucky and we can lead up to that. No, I just I just remember it sounds cliche, but I just remember us respecting those opponents and taking those Auburn and Georgia games one one game at a time because we we weren't ta- we knew we were playing well. I would argue that was part of a two or three week span where we may have been playing the best basketball in the country. Uh, but this is also big time competition, and you never know in the SEC tournament. It's about it's about momentum, right? And so we were we were glad to to get to that championship game. Uh, but let me tell you, you've never seen so much blue in the Superdome. Uh, Kentucky, Kentucky travels well to that SEC Ooh. tournament, and uh, you know we've got some we've got some great stories from that game. Glad glad to tell a couple if you're interested. But uh, yeah, let's let's dig into it because I think that you know to hear it yes. from Cameron Mills' perspective. He said that Kentucky losing to you guys was the greatest thing that happened to them. That getting knocked off, he goes, that just refocuses because they had won twenty seven straight going into that game. Only one SEC team. They go sixteen zero in the SEC. Only one SEC team keeps it within single digits. So they are thumping everybody. And if it's not for an early season loss to UMass, they're still number one in the country. So they're beating the heck out of everyone. And so. That Mississippi State Kentucky yes. game, and and this is the great thing about the YouTube era. This stuff lives on. Like we go watch that game. Um, so <laughs> take us to that game. Like what happens? What stands so out? Da, a, da, da, a Dante Jones highlight reel. Um, and Dante look, Jones think, goes twenty eight points, twelve of eighteen shooting that game. Yeah, yeah, he was unstoppable. Um, and of well, course, as somebody as, as somebody as somebody who guarded him every day in practice, I was glad to see, I was glad to see him doing that to other people, <laughs> and realize that it wasn't just me that couldn't stop him. No, um, it was Ron Mercer and Antoine Walker too, evidently. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, look, we 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 uh, we weren't we were not uh, we were not intimidated at all. I mean, we knew we were going to have to play at a, at a high level. Uh, to, to compete and ultimately win. But, but it was, you know, once that game got rolling, it was kind of one of those deals that each minute that passed by our confidence level grew. And I think their frustration level grew. Uh, in fact, you know, one great story, I can't, I can't share all the, all the language that was involved, but there was a, there was a set play where 
I screened for Eric Dampier and they, they had it scouted. And so they doubled Eric and he dumped a pass to me and I put in a weak little layup under the goal. And, uh, you know, they had crashed down. So I kind of yes. got pushed into the baseline. And as I was circling out to get back on defense, uh, which is a big key for us against you them. As soon as we scored or as soon as we knew we weren't getting to the rebound, you had to sprint back on defense. But, I, but I'm but i sprinting back going by, by the Kentucky bench. And, Bart, you remember this story. Patino is just – Coach Patino <laughs> is hollering to his players, and his basic message was, if y'all are going to let Whit Hughes score against us, then we probably don't have name. a chance to win this he game. He said you know, bro. Um, <laughs> mine, you know um, – I, I, I sometimes get emotional with this story just because Daryl Wilson um, was such a huge part of my whole basketball career. Daryl scored 52 points on me when I was a freshman in high school. Um, and actually, it was not just me guarding him. It was me and my backcourt mate half the time. And so Daryl, people don't realize, Daryl Wilson averaged 39 points a game in high school, guys. I, I mean, people just don't understand, like, just how good he was and just it just continued on. But before that game, well, first off, can, there wasn't one fan wearing blue. There wasn't one coach, one player, one manager, one trainer, one chaplain, anybody on the Kentucky side. They had just come to our place and hammered us 18. They didn't respect us. They didn't think that we you – know, they thought we were good, but they didn't think we were, you know, Kentucky, what have you. Um, and I just remember in that locker room, Daryl asked Coach Williams if he could say a few words before the game. Um, and it just got really silent. And I just remember looking up and looking at him and I saw the emotion of his heart through his eyes. And as those tears were, you remember the no Sean Marino, uh, the, the, uh, <clears throat> national anthem when he's crying so hard and his tears are coming down and people always talk about, they never seen tears like that. Daryl had those tears of intensity and he just didn't really talk. He just said, you know, think about how many times we run all this stuff, guys. Think about just all those, and he mentioned rebounding drills and all the Akins and all. He said, if we do what we do to the level we can do this, this team can't beat us, but we got to do it from the start to the finish. And it just, I don't remember everything he said, but I remember running out. I was completely in like a trance after that. I mean, I was just like, um, and we were so scouted. It was so, and you know, and, and I do want to say something about that game. I remember, you know, a lot of games you don't remember a ton about things happening just because it's electric and it plays. But you know, I, I've heard over the years, I've heard Coach Patino make the statement um, that that was, the, and like Cameron said, that was the best thing that happened to them. Um, you know, that 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 did turn it around for them to where they had to refocus and this and that. And and I've also heard him say, well, you know, I sat Antoine Walker you know, midway through the second, you know, just to prove and this and that, whatever, you know, and like kind of coined at that. I mean, they got beat that day. You guys didn't eke you know, out a win. We, you're right, man. You're – No, you're, they, you're they pretty, got – pretty good. When he sat him, when he sat him, that game was well in hand and we were up 12 or 14. And what I mean by that, I'm not throwing a shot. I'm just saying like that is literally in in a lot of basketball heads' opinion, the, the most talented, best – college team that has ever been assembled now whether they are or not it's not relevant what's relevant though is that you know these two guys sitting with you and our teammates and our coaches you know mississippi alabama you know, tennessee guys wherever um we got a chance to compete against that and we relished it you know and now we're sitting here telling these stories because if we don't beat kentucky in that sec tournament final i don't think things turned out the way they do because when we beat them we knew we could beat anybody we had beaten some good teams that year. You can look down the schedule, the Arkansas's or Sweet 16s, the, um, the Georgia's, you know, in the SEC and, and all the other teams that we played. But when you beat Big Blue Nation in the SEC tournament with six first-round picks and nine pros and John Calipari, bro, you ain't scared of nothing. And all the work that we had put in from and everything that Coach Aiken started instilling all the way through the leadership, all the way through the season, it just came full circle. And the fact that, like, you know, that my idol Bill Raftery was sitting there saying my as, as an announcer saying my name, you know, and my teammates' names. I mean, it was just a it was a perfect storm that day, and not only special for me, but like that's the stories that my family always talks about. That SEC tournament. All right, did you leave a little lingerie on the deck that game? I actually I had a little uh, stop shot. I got my lingerie left on the deck by Jeff Shepard, and it's a great highlight because. He just absolutely explodes by me, but Damp's back there and he tries to dunk his patented tried to dunk on Damp 
damp blocks it and I'm standing there, it makes it look like I didn't just get worked. So my lingerie got left on the deck. Yes. <laughs> You know, Chucker, I would I would say that if you if you surveyed Mississippi State fans about their best memories, I would say one of them will that that will get mentioned every time is seeing the Big Blue Nation, so to speak, following up those stairways in the Superdome to leave once they realized that game was over. There were there were a couple of sequences late in that game where it just became clear that it was going to be our day. Uh, you know, one of them was a, a, a crazy <laughs> random you know, yeah. right at the end of the shot clock over the shoulder desperation shot that I put up there that banked in, you know, total luck. Um, but it goes in right as the shot clock buzzer is going off and, and you could just see the Kentucky fans flip the switch <laughs> and they're like, well, if that's, if that's what today is going to be like, then man, this is over. I hope you went up to coach Patino after said, Whit Hughes, nice to meet you. So <laughs> Not after, not after a shot like that. <laughs> so, you know, Bar touched on this a little bit. So I'll ask you, Whit, you know, how did taking Kentucky down in that SEC tournament championship game, how did that shape your expectations heading into the NCAA tournament? You know, it was it was validation for us because, as, as Bart mentioned, you know, at that point we realized that, that you know, we could, we could beat anybody we faced. Uh, I will tell you, it, it didn't – it really didn't diminish the chip on our shoulder. So this is a little bit of, of trivia history for you. You know, right after the SEC championship game was over, the selection show came on. And so it was timed up back to back. And we, even though we were on this incredible run and beat Kentucky to win the SEC championship, we still got named a five seed for the tournament. And uh, that did not sit well for us because we knew our track record and, and our performance uh, deserve better than that. And, uh, it, it was really just a logistical thing. And yep. in fact, for your listeners, I would say that if you'll notice all the conference championship games now are scheduled differently, they're either on sat Saturday or they're earlier in the day on Sunday to allow enough time for that selection committee to make some last minute adjustments. And I think a lot of that has to do with what we so, experienced back. So in yeah, you guys go in as a number five seed in the Southeast region. You're, you're shipped up to Indianapolis, um, five seeds, as we all know in the tournament, big fans, uh, five seeds can be ripe for upsets, but you guys survive, uh, escape VCU in the first round, 58, 51 in the second round, you face Princeton. We mentioned UCLA earlier. They beat UCLA in the first round as uh, I think a lot of good fans remember, um, UCLA is a defending champ. Princeton pulls off the upset. You guys now face Princeton in the second round. That's a tricky Princeton squad. You know, the Princeton offense, backdoor cuts, Pete Carell. You guys handled them pretty good, 63-41. All these years later, what stands out about that opening weekend of the tournament? So I'll go first, Bart, because I know you want to um, – I definitely want you to comment about the VCU game. You, you, had, a, you had a great day for us that day. <laughs> um, you, know, we had, you know, just from off the floor, one of my favorite memories is Rick Stansberry, the mm -hmm. top assistant at the time, who's now the head coach at Western Kentucky – we went to the St. Elmo Steakhouse as a team, and oh, that's a nice treat. He he he, he mistook their cocktail sauce for ketchup. <laughs> and took oh, a my, huge mouthful funny. of their cocktail sauce, and from a horseradish standpoint, if you've ever experienced that, you'll know you'll know the straight comedy that that took place in the minutes after that, with as he was trying to recover. But yeah, this was in the old RCA dome. Um, VCU, you know, we were fortunate to get past VCU. Bart, Bart really stepped up big time for us that day. Most nervous I've ever been as a basketball player. I don't really, you know, at that level, when you've been doing it for so long, you're kind of just, uh, you go into game mode and you don't notice things like this. But we ran a set play at the end to get the ball inbounds to Daryl Wilson so they could foul him and shoot the free throws to kind of ice the game. Well, they doubled Daryl and this guy turns around and throws it back to me. And they foul and they foul me, so I'm sitting there, ner you know, nervous as all get out, trying to knock down two free throws at the end of that game to, to help ice it. But uh, Bart, talk a little bit about that. That's just a perfect storm for me, um, uh, Chucker. My uh, Sonny Smith was the coach at VCU, and he had been at Auburn for years, and um, he and my dad were really, really good friends. And so Sonny actually taught me how to shoot a basketball um at his camp i went to his camp for you know six years growing up uh and, and was just i was an auburn guy you know and everybody kind of you know it was just 
no one knew except me in, in our locker room how special that game was about to be to me. But no, we 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 weren't playing well, and it was the five twelve thing. It's just like you can watch all those games in NCAA. It was there. It was going there. I'd watch those games as a kid. I'd what, and it just kind of it worked out. I mean, I, I literally somehow got two wide open looks. I mean, and it was uh, a couple of diagonal passes out of the post because they were so concerned on um, their. Uh, um, damp in the post, and then uh, they double. They were doubling the post every time, and so I just would get where the ball could see me, young kids out there, and I got where the ball could see me. Teammates hit me, and it was just fluid. And the second one I remember was right in front of Sonny, um, and then it just—I mean, after the game, uh, I remember he hugged me and he said, "I'll never forgive myself for teaching you to shoot it so well." Um, and so that one was, that game was, uh, for me, um, it, it just, the emotion of that, uh, was very high level and, you know, I mean, which right, that was of all the games that I contributed into this amazing team. I think that was the one time that we always talked about in the preseason Our coach Aikens always talked about, he said, there's going to be that one time to where you're going to have to step up. And he talked that to each one of us. And that was my time. And fortunately it worked, but I'll tell you what I remember about the Princeton game. I remember that night. Um, we were watching in the hotel. We were in our individual rooms because it was after curfew. And I remember, I mean, you could hear in the hotel when the back cut happened, we were basketball fans. I mean, sure, we wanted to play Princeton instead of UCLA. Why wouldn't you? They had the defending national champions, you know. I just remember hearing everybody, on, our whole team on the floor go, yeah, like when the, when, when the, when the uh, layup happened. But Coach Williams, and he gives credit in the assist, in the in the post game press conference after Princeton to our assistant coaches and names them by name: um, Greg Carter, Rick Stansbury, Owen Miller, and George Brooks. The game plan they we zoned Princeton Chucker, we zoned them. We didn't have to do all that mess with with, with dealing with the back cuts and the, and the funny bet was who's going to get back cut first? Who's going to get back cut first? And I'll let Witt tell you who that was. But at the same time, I remember in the scouting report, um, we were so attention to detail. Coach Williams uh, was about seal ins and seal outs with the post players. All right, so when the ball's being reversed back across the top, they're zoning you. If you I fake one way and even ball fake, you're going to have an open up for a backside post. I'll bet we hit that. I don't remember how many times we worked on it with, but we hit that at least six, seven times in the first half. You know, just my point is our attention to detail, um, Richard Williams, and I know it was at the end of his career and what have you, but Richard Williams out coach Coach Carrill that day. Now, obviously, he had the players. We were probably a little bit higher level players. A lot of our guys were. Um, but I just – I remember that second game just sitting over there like how amazing – our scouting report was. And then it just carried on into the next couple of games. Cause like we said earlier, we knew everything they were going to do, but not only did we know what they were going to do, what we were going to do was so broken down and what to look for that all you had to do was follow directions. Like you were in third grade. Yeah. That was coach Carrill's last game of his, of his coaching career. Right. So that was, that was a big deal. But yeah, I think, I do think that was a brilliant approach because the difficulty in garden Princeton's offense is that it's all, it's all based on how the defenders guard you. And so their, 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 their activity on offense is dictated by what the defenders are doing. So there's really no way to prepare for that. Uh, and, they're, and they're so good at it. And, and Bart's right. I think, I'm, I think I was probably responsible for instigating a lot of side betting that was going on among the teammates on who was going to be the first to get back cut and just you know, leave their man naked under the goal for a wide open layup. <laughs> And of course, I, I I I went on record as saying there was no way in the world that was going to be on me. record. And <laughs> sure enough, my dude back cuts, and I I pretty much have to bear hug him, so so they can't even make the pass for the layup. Coach Williams calls timeout, Chucker. He calls a thirty second timeout, and he was silent for the first twenty six seconds of the thirty seconds. Doesn't say a word. He just makes eye contact with us and looks around the huddle. And finally, he turns to me and he says, Wit, they go to Princeton. They're smarter yes. than you. Stop Just trying story. to figure out their offense and do what we're coaching y'all to do. And then the horn, the horn sounds, and we all go back on the court and continue the game. All right. Well, as we know what happens in the NCAA tournament, man, every game 
it steps up a level and uh, it gets more intense and it gets more heated and, and all that good stuff. So in the Sweet 16, you guys face UConn. That team's led by a, a guy named Ray Allen, pretty good shooter, um, pretty good team. You face a tough Cincinnati team in the Elite Eight. You know, survive and advance is the rallying cry of March Madness. So in that second weekend, you know, was there a moment where you thought the run was over? You know, where you thought, oh, wow, this has been nice, but now I got to start, you know, I got the term paper in psychology due next week. Uh, you know, or did you kind of say, did, was there this kind of belief that we're going to find a way out of this? I would say 100%. We, we, were, we were ready to roll through that regional. Um, you got to remember, Danny, that the, the second weekend host site was Rupp Arena. So that was that that was very familiar with us. Those surroundings uh, was something we had experienced before. So I think that may have been a little bit of a a little bit of an advantage, uh, just to have some comfort level to counteract you know all the all the quote unquote noise that was going on around you. You know UConn, you know Ray Allen, Sheffer, Travis Knight. I mean that was a big time squad. They were the one seed in that regional. So that was a big time. That was a big deal for us to beat them. As I recall, I think Daryl Wilson went crazy in that game with a bunch of threes. Uh, and then Cincinnati is what an hour away from Rupp Arena. So again, go, going back to that whole di- chip chip on the shoulder dynamic, uh, they fill their fans filled up Rupp Arena the next day. And if you looked at all the media coverage and and everything else we were seri- seeing and hearing and experiencing, it was very clear that Cincinnati was just presuming that they were going to carry the day and go on to the final four. And so that, that, that added a little you know, bit. Of one thing motivation. too, I think after the Kentucky win, I think that gained us um, some respect. Um, they wanted another shot at us. I mean, they didn't think we would get as far as they did, but some of, there was some blue in there um, at that regional, you know, and that blue in there was pulling for us. Um, a lot of people don't remember. Um, Stefan Marbury was in that regional um at tech and you know he was as good and they were as good as anybody and um but cincinnati just guarded them i I just i remember i remember walking out on the floor and seeing ray allen and i had to like check myself and 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 get my time i was like oh my gosh that's i mean that's ray allen you know i mean and and it was just the stage was but like Whit said i had never been to rub because i wasn't there the, the the year before um, and so it was new to me, but you know, our fans traveled so well, it, but I don't think we ever had that thought. I know going into the game, we never, we didn't have a doubt. Cause I mean, like I said, after being Kentucky, we were prepared to play with and beat anybody, but we never really got behind either Danny. I mean, we, we were in, in all those games. Um, for the most part, um, we were ahead, you know, and we were getting ahead by like, it was, it, it was not as big of a lead, but kind of like that Kentucky game. You know, so when we were getting ahead, it just kind of was if we just continue to maintain – because when we got a lead and the ball got in Marcus Bullard's hands in the half court to make decisions on where to go and we had our set plays, I mean, in the – you know, it was um, – we, we were tough to deal with because it was so hard to score on the defensive end from us. But I, the two things we did in that regional that I remember above anything else, we made a ton of shots – and we really got stops in the half court. And that's the reason that we were able to beat those two amazing teams with all those players and those great coaches. You know, Chucker, Eric Dampier never talked. And I'm not, I'm not like exaggerating for dramatic effect. Like the guy didn't talk, but he was in a press conference leading into the Cincinnati game. And there was this prevailing storyline that they were just tougher and stronger and going to out physical us. And uh, I remember the one thing he said, and it was just like a one-line quote, uh, Eric says, y'all do know we lift weights too. <laughs> and so, uh, and so again, just extra motivation for the, for the media as a whole to think that we were an underdog because the other team was going to be tougher than us or stronger than us. I the mean, question was, was Fortson. They were talking about Fortson's toughness and like, how are you, how is that going to be for you? How, and Damp's sitting there like, are y'all serious, man? I mean, I mean, cause that year Dant was the best defender, the defensive player in the country. I mean, you can take the Cambies, you can take the, that year, Eric Dampier top to bottom to me. I mean, he just, he was so dominant. Um, and it was just, but at the same time, I mean, the, our whole story was about gaining and earning respect, you know, and anytime people question you and, and when you got something about you and you keep on plugging and keep on plugging, it, it's going to turn out well, but, 
you know, we were still fighting for that respect. And I think that's what Damp said. And he went out and showed – he played 40 minutes in that game, Chucker. 40 minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's the first time and only time he played 40 minutes the whole year. Yeah. You know, that 73-63 win over Cincy gives Mississippi State its first Final Four appearance in school history. We've talked about – Mississippi State, you guys have had the season where, you know, um, football kind of reigns there, but then there's such energy for March Madness. But then you guys have this, I'm sorry, not March Madness, uh, uh, Midnight Madness. Then you guys have this skid and you have a home game and there's 3,000 people there. And what's Starkville like when you guys get back? <laughs> Go ahead, with. Well, I mean, look, I know I'm, I'm, I'll try to be brief because we could go on, but, um, you know, we're on the plane ride back. And I can't remember who it was, but, but somebody said, y'all got to look at this. And we looked out as we were on approach to Golden Triangle Regional Airport there in Columbus. We looked out the windows of the plane. And you remember this scene from the movie Field of Dreams, where as far as you could look in the distance, there was headlights from cars that were lined up. Highway 82 leading into the airport looked like the scene out of that movie. As far as you can see there from Columbus to Starville, there were headlights. We land. People are like, uh, I don't know, from the time we get down the stairway on the plane all the way out to the other side of the terminal where our shuttle bus was, people were probably, what, bar 20 people deep on each side. It took us, it took us well over an hour to walk, you know, 60, 70 yards from where our plane was parked through the terminal out the entrance on the other side to get into our shuttle bus. I mean, it was, it was, it was chaos. I mean, that's the only word for it. It was chaos. I mean, the, it, the, the emotional release from the fan base was just like anything I had ever experienced because I mean, certainly from a basketball standpoint, we had never, we had never reached a level like that. And, and, uh, uh, that's that's the only way I know how to describe it was just complete chaos. It, it, it was – we were so – I mean, but but I think we were just still hype. Everybody was. And the fan base at that time – because, see, most of the time we flew into Starville, you know, the small airport, and so and, or just flew out of it. But, like, you know, we had a charter flight and so but I just – you know, that's definitely the first time in my life um, and only time that I've um, – you know, ever been kissed on the mouth by a 70 year old woman, um, walking through a line, uh, that, but it was just, it was just that type of emotion. I mean, they just wanted to show us how big a deal it was and that we had made, we had made their day, you know, we, had, and that was the thing you have very few times in, uh, in your lives. Um, you know, you do actually you have a lot of opportunities to, to make someone's day, but for us to be able to make that many people's day, um, and I and I told the story a couple of weeks ago with it was a buddy of mine riding with me to start with it knew nothing about it. I was coming on 82 from Columbus um, and I told him that story about I said, man, I can't even tell you. And, and the, it's not like the airport, like these cars. I mean, these cars were well over a mile back to 82, like just lined up all the way down the ramp, you know, and, and just to come out and show their appreciation for something. To be quite honest, I don't think, you know, many Mississippi State fans like they all wanted it. You know, but did they really believe it? I mean, did they really believe that it would? And then, then you get to taste it. And um, and and, and that night, I, that's like what said. It's just like field of dreams, basketball field of dreams. I'll never forget that night. That's sweet. So you guys uh, go to New Jersey to face Syracuse in the Final Four. That Syracuse team that's led by an All American and John Wallace, obviously a Hall of Fame coach, in um, Jim Beheim. What moments before tip off still resonate with you? You know, was there a pregame speech from Coach Williams, a walk through the night before, an offhanded comment from a teammate? What kind of sticks with you? I don't remember a lot about it, um, to be honest with you. Um, I, I just remember everything was so fast um, that leading up to that week, there were so many more media people, um, you know, and, and there's so many distractions um, that we weren't used to, um, that we felt like, you know, I think um, it, it was a national deal now. You know, we'd kind of flown under the radar a little bit, a little bit, but now it was, you know, it was here. Um, and I just remember there wasn't really a whole lot I remember um, leading up to it about things that were like we discussed, and it was just different. It, it was just for some reason, you know, I've got state championship games that were like this. 
the, the memories are just different. Um, it was like there was a different feeling. Um, even when we got on the bus, you know, we left, you know, we, we ended up, we were stalled a little bit and we were 15 minutes late getting, getting to the arena. And it was just like everything was a little rushed and it just wasn't. Unlike all those other games, uh, Chucker, it just wasn't our night. Um, it just wasn't our night. And I feel like that it, um, you know, I don't want to say the moment was too big. Um, I'm just going to say that we didn't play all uh, up to our potential as, as we possibly could have. And maybe we didn't handle those distractions as well as we had handled everything else leading up to it. Let's stick with you, Bart. I want to talk about um, what was the locker room, though, like after that game, after that loss? Because you had this moment, it seems like, of mm -hmm. I don't know if it's regret, but you feel like, God, we let that one get away. We weren't even in the game as well as we didn't play the way we knew we could play. So what, what do you recall about the locker room after the game? It, it was just deflated. Um, we, we were deflated, um, in a sense that we knew what you just said. We, we knew that we hadn't played to our potential. Um, but, but it wasn't a lot of talking, you know, there was a lot of silence. Um, and then I think, you know, when we were in the locker room, coach Williams talked to us and, you know, he gave us, you know, as, as, as good of a speech as he can. I just, I remember him mentioning and talking about the seniors um and what they had meant and what they had done for this program and how what we had done will transcend throughout the history of basketball not only in the state of mississippi but also you know throughout the united states and it will give so much hope to small programs and and then after that i remember at the end he said y'all go love on these seniors and that's what we did um it was just you know we we somehow and i and i just remember um Coach Akins, I don't know if he remember this. Um, he came and he said, "Talk about the good stories on the way home," and that was just great advice, you know, because like we needed to tap in and feel. Um, you know, there's nothing other than losing my dad uh, in my life, uh, Danny. There's nothing that is like a dejection of losing a state championship or losing a game, a big game like that. You don't think the sun's going to come up the next day. You know, and I know that sounds like in some people's lives that may be, but it's you put so much time, you put so much work, and you want it so bad for your teammates, man. And then, like, when you go through it and your teammates are leaving, you know, this is it. I mean, these guys that I've come in, and Daryl Wilson's my idol, and he's gone. And Russell Walters that's, that's brought me to this point, um, you know, under his wing as well. Uh, and Jay Walton, um, you know, and, and but especially like Daryl. Um, that was just tough, you know, and then you start thinking about this might be the last time you play with Dante um, because he may go to the league, you know, and then all, all, all I knew to do was just love on those guys and tell them thank you. And so that's just kind of like when my dad died, you know, I started telling all the nurses the same thing just because anytime you're in adversity like that, you try to, you, you try to spread two things, gratitude and hope. Um, and that just, that kicked in for me. And that's, just, that's what I remember about it is just trying to love on those seniors. Yeah, that was a that was a tough locker room for sure. Uh, there was no way to hide or overcome the 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 emotions and the disappointment. But I really think Coach Williams did a nice job. Bart, you mentioned this earlier. He he added a quite a bit of perspective, just telling us um, that we really in the moment had no idea what we had just accomplished. Yeah. That what we had done this season and reaching the Final Four was going to become a part of our identity for the rest of our lives. And, and that was absolutely yes. true. That's, that's, that's been true then. It's still true today. I mean, it is very – for a long time, it was, it was daily. Um, but it's very unusual for a week to go by, even now, where I don't have somebody either that I know or somebody that I've never even met before want to talk about that season and, and the final season. It's a fitting, you know, you guys accomplished a lot that year. It's it's worth noting both of you have more time left at Mississippi State. Wit, you start 56 games over the next two seasons. Bart, you're a fixture at the guard position over the next three seasons in Starkville. Um, but you, uh, sadly, neither of you guys ever played another NCAA tournament game, which I think adds another maybe layer to, to how much that final four loss probably hurts, even, maybe even a little bit more. But um, I Let's talk about just kind of the present day. Are you guys still involved with hoops? What are you guys doing today? Yeah, I'm, I, 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 uh, I, I spend time uh, with a commercial general contractor here in Mississippi called Alliant Construction, which is part of the Ergon family of companies. It's a private, you know, 70-plus-year-old family-owned business here in Mississippi that uh, 
3,000 plus employees and selling product in 90 countries around the world. So uh, I enjoy being part of their team. And I also, uh, on a consulting basis, I'm involved uh, in an executive search firm. And, you know, my, my real attachment and involvement to the game at this point is, has been uh, coaching all three of my kids uh, in basketball over the years. So uh, I'm, I'm no longer at that station in life because now they're playing school ball. But but there's there's nothing I enjoyed more than coaching my my kids in their younger years. Well, Chucker, I'm back in the game, baby. Um, I was uh, in outside sales in dental uh, sales and consulting for 18 years, um, and soft semi retired uh, from dental about two months ago, actually. Um, and there's a facility up in North Alabama, um, a little south of Huntsville and Lake Gunnersville, called Supreme Courts. And there's the three courts here. We train. Um, we're doing all kinds of high school TV games out of here. I'm dabbling into volleyball. I'm doing media, doing some marketing. But uh, I'm in the gym uh, every day uh, working uh, some of the top players in the state of Alabama, um, girls and boys. Uh, so, yeah, I, I'm uh, for the first time, uh, I lost my love after uh, those last three years. You know, it was it was it was tough. I mean, I, back to the final four real quick. You know, after, uh, you know, we had uh, three guys coming back, uh, scholarship guys coming back. Uh, me and Witt and Tyrone, that was it after that Final Four team. It's a complete reload, and, and we never really quite – but my senior year, like Witt's, how his career started, uh, my senior year ended with me watching TV and us not getting in the tournament. Um, and then we lost in NIT, and that's how the career ended. So that was pretty much it for basketball for me um, for about 18 years. And then now being back in the gym, um, being able to talk it, you know, being on the media side, being on the radio a lot and TV, it's uh, – you know, basketball is something that uh, I'll, I'll never not have uh, in my life daily, ever, ever, ever again, because it's been so important to my journey, my walk, and uh, and I'm just fortunate to finally be be able to be back part of it. Well, that's what we like to hear at 19.9, people back in the game, loving it. Um, so uh, I just want to get some quick hits before we get out of here. I'll ask them fast and furious, and you guys can reply just as fast and furious, and then we'll lock it up here. So favorite arena to play in? Memorial Gymnasium at Vanderbilt. Memorial Gymnasium at Vanderbilt. Gotcha. The recessed floor. Uh, it's really easy to make it. shots in that place with that blacked out when it, when it blacked out behind the it's blacked out behind the basket. That's a shooter's gym beyond any more any other. Gotcha. Best player you competed against while at Mississippi State. Well, I would say the toughest person I ever had to guard was actually Daryl Wilson, my own teammate. Uh but, I, you know, I guarded some good ones. I think of Ryan Miner, who was a uh, uh, high-level, actually high-level baseball and ba uh, basketball guy out of Oklahoma. He was a tough guard. And then uh, Ansu Cisse from Ole Miss was a, a tough guy to match up with because, uh, you know, if, if, if I guarded him, he would take us out on the perimeter. And if somebody, you know, more that fit more of the guard profile, he would take them down low and post them up. So he was always a tough matchup. I think the best player um, <clears throat> for me would have been uh, definitely that I ever was in front of was Ray Allen. I, I don't think there's any question about that. Um, I was a freshman, what have you. But day in, day out, my four years, um, shout out to Maurice Carter um, from LSU, who ended up playing in the league um, for a while, was back and forth, whatever. But he was a lefty, super athletic. We came out of high school together. He's a Mississippi guy. Hey, Bart, um, you remember during the, that game, there was a moment yeah. where we somehow got switched <laughs> off and I had to yeah. pick up Ray Allen for one possession. And Jim Jim Nance and Billy Packer started going off on how I, I'm I'm pretty sure that's not the matchup that right. and he was a defensive like specialist. <laughs> <laughs> hey, don't let him before you get this next question. This guy sitting here next to you, Ron Miner, was leading the nation in scoring when we went to Oklahoma and won that final four year. And we didn't mention how big that game was. We went out to Oklahoma and won out there, and we held him to like seven of twenty two. Um, or, or, or half that game, he and Bull. Um, seven of 22 from the field. So shout out to Will on that one. Good. Shout out Will. That's what we like to hear. All right. This is always an interesting one to me. The trickiest team you played against while at Mississippi State. The most clever team, Will. Who was it? Uh, yeah. Oh, gosh. It'd, it'd be hard not to say uh, 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 Princeton just because of the, the notoriety of their offense and the challenges that go along with that. I know we kind of flipped the script in terms of the game plan we had, but but we didn't realize we were going to do that until we went into the shoot around before the game and started going over the scouting report. So the anxiety level around trying to uh, 
prepare from Princeton and make sure you weren't the guy that mm-hmm. got the the first back cut put on you. Uh, was was something um, I always remember. To me, it would be um, Cliff Ellis at Auburn. Um, he was a junk defense, and this that would be probably more personal to me because my last three years I was playing the two coming off screens, and it was always a different junk defense. And I consider that sneaky because I'm a junk defense guy, you know, when I coach. Um, but, yeah, Cliff Ellis just would throw so many different things at you defensively that you couldn't figure out what it was. And, uh, you know, in Auburn, Auburn had success against us um, in, in Whit, latter, latter in our, uh, Whit and I's career. And I think uh, the sneakiness of Cliff Ellis is one of the reasons. Gotcha. All right. Let's take away Ole Miss because we already spoke of that rivalry and beating Ole Miss means a little something extra. So which team though, outside of Ole Miss, did you take a little extra satisfaction in beating? You know, probably, uh, probably for me personally, it was Alabama because uh, my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife was, she went to Alabama her first two years of school and I inevitably was going to spend a lot of time over in Tuscaloosa. So I, I got some extra satisfaction out of beating them because uh, I knew I was going to have to spend spend a lot of time around Alabama fans. Inevitably, Whit, you drove over there two or three nights a week the whole time she was there. Like after, so I mean, he put he put he put in work, not just on the court, man. Hey man he, he, I, he I locked to, it up, man. He should have. Uh, I, had I, had, I had to stay. I had uh, to for stay. For me, there's the no picture. question. It's Alabama, uh, Danny. I, I, and everybody here knows <laughs> that I poke fun at them radio all the time. I grew up hating them. Um, they offered me a scholarship and rescinded it. Um, and then they came and uh, beat us the first time in Starkville on the last second shot final full year. But um, I think I think it's that we – State had won there maybe two times before Daryl and I got there. Um, and I know Daryl won there a couple times, but I went three and one in Tuscaloosa um, at their place 40 minutes from my house. And so – And those three felt pretty good. Oh, man. Um, and But Alabama – uh, for me, it was it was where I was from. There was so much animosity in my heart already. Um, Alabama was was definitely the game that I had circled. Sometimes, you know, I'll be honest with you, I, I knew when that Alabama game was before I knew when that Ole Miss game was. Finally, which program had the wildest fans? I'll give you guys some extra credit if you have a good story here, but go ahead. Oh. <laughs> Not close. Yeah, I'll give you two. Yeah, points. yeah, no, it was, look – the fans at Arkansas yes. made going to Bud Walton oh. Arena such a unique experience. Now, Chucker, <laughs> really? you got to realize the internet was just becoming a thing, right? So information wasn't readily available. And there certain, certainly wasn't anything. Nobody even knew what social media yeah. was back then, right? But you would show up for games and you would go out to shoot around. And this is, you know... Two hours right. before the game, you know, yeah. and, and the, the student section would already be full. Not only that, they would have copies of the MSU media guide. Not only that, well, they would have done your research on you, your friends, your family, your girlfriend. High school and girlfriend. They, they, had, they had talking points ready to go. And I'm not talking about soft talking points. Like they were ready to hurt, they were ready to hurt your feelings. And uh, they came, they came <laughs> after my guy Bart here pretty hard there. <laughs> Man, I I was always an easy target, man. I know you can you can see me now, but man. I had this long flowing hair. Dude, you had floppy yes. floppy hair. You're five eleven white dude with floppy hair, shaved into a V in the back. <laughs> like just it was so like. But like, I remember getting off the bus there at nine a.m. for shoot around that morning, and they, they were there. I mean, they were there yelling at us. I mean, screaming at us. But I remember like like you talking about before the game, they had this crazy band director. And like the band would be sitting there, you walk out and nobody say anything. And all of a sudden he had some kind of like unleash them onto the player. And man, I remember one night I had gotten in a little trouble in the off season, um, my sophomore year going into my junior year. And so uh, everybody always was yelling at me, telling me I didn't need to be out on the court, telling me whatever. Well, I just remember um, this one guy, all of a sudden, the first thing they said, he yelled out, he said, Hey Bart, I got a six pack under here under the car. You want this before the game, or you want this shot of vodka over here? And then so it was kind of everybody laughing. They're going nuts. Well, then my dad walks down to see me. He had driven to Fayetteville, and he walks over. and, and State fans will get this because my career, you know, it, it's synonymous with, with with some of my off the court stuff uh, that I learned a lot from. But I remember him walking down, and I, I stopped and talked to him. And, and luckily, they didn't say anything to my dad while he was sitting there, like while he was talking to me. But as he starts up, some guy goes out. Hey Bart, who is that? Who is that? Your lawyer? You know, who's that? Your DUI counselor? Um, and I just remember that it was no holes barred. I mean, they knew my high school girlfriend's name. 
they knew, I mean, I don't know how they knew all the things that they knew, but at the same time, it goes to the passion of showing that basketball supersedes everything especially at Arkansas. And so all of those stories, all those shots, people think it it took at me, you know, with things, you know, whether it be, um, I did get hit in the head with things during warmups at Ole Miss um, a couple of times, but the bottom line is, you know, people do love basketball down here. That's where I'm going with this. Um, And they are passionate about it like everywhere else, but without question, um, the hardest core fans, hardest place to play anywhere I ever played in college basketball you know, at, at Bandy and at Arkansas are the only two places I didn't win. And Arkansas is the only place I ever played where I would be sitting in church the next day and my ears would still be ringing from playing yeah. at Bud Walton Arena the day before. So loud, man. <laughs> All right. Well, Witt and Bart, we're, we're going to end it there. We're so grateful you could spend some time with us t- on the 99 podcast talking about Mississippi State hoops and that memorable Final Four run in 1996. Thank you for listening to the 199 podcast. If you haven't already subscribed to the podcast, make sure you do. And while you're at it, leave us a rating or review. Five stars only, like the basketball camp. We also have links to all of 199 social media so you never miss a release. Until next time, 